In previous videos of this lecture series, we introduced the idea of fields and skew fields, which these are rings for which every non-zero element is invertible. It has a multiplicative inverse or a so-called reciprocal. Now, not every ring we've studied is a field or even a skew field, right? Like the integers, right? It's, the only invertible elements there are going to be plus or minus one. Most elements are not invertible. If you take a polynomial ring, even if the coefficient ring is a field, uh, the polynomial ring itself is not going to be a field or a skew field. Uh, group rings also have that characteristic that even if the coefficients are a field, right, group elements themselves, every group element is invertible. But when you make a ring out of it, you're going to create lots of elements which are not invertible. Same thing can be also said for matrix rings. So when we study rings, we're very interested in when is an element invertible or not. And we're interested so much that we give it a name. If R is a ring with unity, uh, which if we don't have unity, then there's no reason to talk about reciprocals. If R is a ring with unity and we take some element little r inside of R, we say that little r is a unit if there exists some multiplicative inverse. That is, the ring contains some multiplicative inverse of R. We call it R to the negative one right there. Uh, and so we're very interested when we study rings in units. What elements are units? How many units does the ring have? What are the units? How can we classify the units? Um, so the set of all units inside of a ring with unity is often denoted R star. Uh, sometimes it's denoted U of R, uh, so the, 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 the set of units right there. Now, I want to mention that the set of units inside of a ring forms a group, which is necessarily a multiplicative group. Why is it, why is it multiplicative? Okay, well, that's actually, there's a nice little argument there, which clearly one is a unit. One belongs to R star. And this comes from the fact that if you take one times one, that's equal to one. So it has an inverse itself, right? The inverse of one is itself one. Um, I also want to show you that uh, if you're a unit, then you have a multiplicative inverse, duh. So if R is inside of R star, that means that R times R inverse equals one which equals R inverse R. In particular, it has an inverse R star necessarily. Well, as R, uh, R negative one, excuse me, but R negative one likewise has an inverse. That's just going to equal R because of the uniqueness of inverses. Uh, that's going to come down from the associativity axiom here. And so if, if R is in R star, then R inverse is going to be in there as well. So we get that this set of units is closed under um, multiplicative inverses. Closure is also pretty easy. If you have R and S, which are inside of R star right here, then we know that there's some R inverse, there's some S inverse. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take R S and I'm going to multiply it by S inverse R inverse, right? Thinking of the shoe sock principle, you have to reverse the order when you do the inverses. Then by associativity, this will equal R R inverse, which equal the identity. And therefore S inverse R inverse is equal to rs inverse and this is a two-sided inverse if i go from the other side you'll notice that s inverse r inverse times rs uh the r's cancel and then the s's cancel and you get one again so we get that rs will be inside of r star so this is in fact a group it's called the group of units and it's a very important question as we study ring theory what is the group of units for that ring uh, in fact a group uh, excuse me, a ring is a skew field if and only if the group of units is everything that's non-zero. So let's look at a few examples of the units of some rings, some of which I've already alluded to. So if we take the, the ring of integers, this is not a field, like I mentioned earlier, the group of units is going to be plus or minus one. The only integers which are invertible will be plus one, the unity, and negative one, it's Identity or its additive inverse. You can also argue that if a u, if an element is a unit, then its additive inverse is likewise a unit. If say u belongs to R star, then that means there's some u times u inverse that equals one. Well, what happens if we take say negative u? Well, the inverse of negative u is going to equal that. That is the ad, the inverse the reciprocal of negative u is actually negative the reciprocal of u there. And we can see that very easily from properties we've proven previously. Notice if I take negative u and you multiply that by negative u inverse, right? So that is I'm taking the additive inverse of the reciprocal of u. Um, based upon properties of rings we've seen already, then this will give you u times u inverse. That is a double negative is a positive and that gives you one there. So uh, inverses, that in units inside of a ring, their additive inverses are likewise units, okay? Um, so in that case, 
for, for a ring with unity, you always get plus or minus one as units. But then it turns out in the integers, there's no other units. You have sort of like these two guaranteed units, but no other ones, right? The integers don't have a lot of units. Um, what about Z n, for example, if we take the ring mod, uh, the ring of modular arithmetic n, well, we've talked about the group of units there, uh, Z n star. We actually use the notation Z n star sort of forecasting, foreshadowing this group of units we had before. Uh, and so we know for Zn star, this consists of all integers which are co-prime to n. Um, and we've studied this, we studied this group extensively. Um, so if n has if n has very few divisors, it'll have very many, uh, there'll be a lot of units inside of the ring Zn. In fact, like we've seen previously, if n is a prime, then Zn is actually a field. So everything's a unit except for negative one. Um, how about how about the matrix ring? M, that is, let's take all the n by n matrices over the coefficient, the scalar the scalar ring R in that situation. Well, if we're looking for the units, that is, we're looking for those n by n matrices which have a multiplicative inverse, that's what we usually call a non-singular matrix. Um, and so the group of units for the for a matrix ring is actually what we call the general linear group. So we've studied this group a lot in this series as well, for which we've talked about the general linear group with real and complex coefficients. That's the unit group for the for the uh, the ring of real matrices or complex matrices. And this can be generalized to any field or any ring, in fact. We can define the matrix ring with any coefficient ring, in which case then we can also talk about the general linear group over any other ring. This would be the group of invertible matrices. So we could talk about the general linear group of n by n integer matrices right here, which it could be, there might not be a lot, right? You might have the identity matrix, you might have negative one times the identity matrix, uh, but there's not gonna necessarily, there might not be a lot. Now, interesting, the, there are a lot of integer matrices whose inverses themselves are integer matrices. For example, um, if, a de if the determinant of an integer matrix is plus or minus one, its inverse will likewise be an integer matrix. Um, so this, this, this group does contain all integer matrices uh, plus or minus, whose determinant is plus or minus one. Uh, but of course you can get some other things in there as well. Okay, um, if, when it comes to polynomial rings, the unit group is actually very simple. If you have the polynomial ring Rx, then the units are just the units of R, that is, R bracket X star is just R star. And what I mean by that is the only polynomials which are invertible that are units are gonna be the, are gonna be constant polynomials which themselves are invertible. And that's from the following argument here, that if you take the degree of a polynomial, if you take the degree of F times G, right? You have two polynomials, you multiply them together. The, the degree of their product is going to be the degree of F plus the degree of G. And the main reason behind that is when you multiply together polynomials, if you take the leading term of one, let's like say that's powers M, and you times it by the leading term of the other, that's N, then you add together their degrees, M plus N. And this never reduces down for standard polynomial multiplication right here. And so the degree always gets bigger when you multiply two polynomials together. It can never get smaller. Now it could stay the same, because you can have degree zero polynomials for which a polynomial its degree is zero if and only if f of x here is a constant, like say some c right here. In fact, the unity of a polynomial ring is gonna be the constant polynomial f of x equals one. So the only way, which, which then its degree is zero, right? So the only way that the product of two polynomials degree can equal zero is if they were already constant polynomials. You have to have a constant times a constant. For which, if you're a constant, then you're essentially just an element of the coefficient ring, um, in which case you didn't have to be a unit of that. So, okay, so some of these rings, uh, their unit groups are groups we already know very well, like these ones. Some of them are also easy to describe, so polynomials don't offer anything new. Um, so the last example I want to talk about with, with respect to units is a little bit more complicated. It's the idea of units inside of a group ring. Okay, so let's say we have some group G, some ring R, um, then the calculation of units is a lot more difficult. Now, there are some obvious situations, like if I take the units of the coefficient ring, that'll be inside the unit group, much in the same manner here, although equality we would not expect. We also have that the group itself 
would be inside of the unit group of the group ring, okay? Um, and the reason for that is if you have a group element, the group element can be viewed as an element of the group ring, right? And each of these are invertible because if you multiply it by its inverse, which is also an element of the group ring, you get the identity back, uh, the multiplicative identity. So the units inside of the coefficient ring will be units inside of the group ring. And then the elements of the group themselves are. And so these two classes of units are often referred to as the trivial units inside of a group ring. We predict those ones will be there. And so what many people who study group rings are concerned about is that are there non-trivial units? That is, is there some combination of group elements uh, so that you get a unit? Let me give you such an example. So let's take the group ring uh, over the symmetric group S3. And to keep things simple, we'll just have integer coefficients. It turns out the coefficient ring matters a lot on what you can do to make a unit or not. Uh, but I'll give you one with integer coefficients, okay? So let's introduce the element mu. Um, it's going to be 1 plus the, the, the 3 cycle 1, 2, 3 minus the 3 cycle 1, 3, 2 plus the 2 cycle 1, 3 minus the 2 cycle 2, 3. Now, as a group ring, these elements, we can't add or subtract these elements together. These are like different terms. It's like in a previous algebra class, if you take x plus y, can you simplify that? No. The, formally, that's the sum. They can't be, we can't combine any like terms there. Um, I claim that the inverse of mu is going to be 1 minus 1, 2, 3 plus 1, 3, 2 minus 1, 3 and plus 2, 3, which you'll notice, basically, I changed the sign of all of the non-identity, none of all the non-constant terms in that combination. I don't claim that'll work in general, but it kind of feels like it's a conjugate in like a complex conjugate sense or a quaternion conjugate sense. Again, I don't claim that's going to work in general. There's a little bit more going on behind the scenes here. Don't look at the man behind the curtain. So if we actually work out the details of mu times mu inverse. I have them on the screen right here. Feel free to pause it and work out the, or better yet, work out the details yourself. But as you work through the products inside of this, I mean, there's a lot going on here. I mean, this has five terms in it. This has five terms in it. So as you multiply all of these things out, it can get a little bit messy. It can. Um, I mean, there's like 25 possible products you have to compute. But what you're going to see is that everything is going to cancel out when you're done. You do have an identity. You have a number one right here. That's the only thing that's going to be left around. Notice I've organized the data in such a way that you see that the 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 cancels. 1, 3, 2, 1, 3, 2 cancels. 1, 2 cancels. 1, 3 cancels. 2, 3 cancels. 2, 3 cancels. 1, 3 cancels. 1, 2 cancels. You see all this cancellation. Boom and boom. Everything's going to cancel out except for a 1. So this is, in fact, an authentic unit of the group ring. And it's going to be a non-trivial unit. And so that's kind of where I want to end this video here and just mention that the study of non-trivial units in a group ring is a much, much more complicated problem. Uh, the study of units is a very, very active field of research in modern um, abstract algebra because just from a purely mathematical point of view, it's a very interesting question, very intriguing, but also there are some many practical applications. Believe it or not, uh, finding units inside of a group ring is very related to the coding theory problems we developed earlier in this lecture series. So developing uh, more sophisticated, more effective error detecting, error correcting codes has a lot to do with recognizing units inside of a group ring.